Now, you know, you don't have to wait until you get to heaven to sing and shout the victory. Amen. Okay, now some of you got that. All right, we'll, we'll try that. You, you don't have to wait till you get to heaven to sing and shout the victory. Amen. There we go. Hey, we're getting there. All right. Well, on this Veterans Day weekend, we are honored and pleased to have a special guest preacher this morning, Chaplain Commander Gary Thornton. He is a commander in the United States Navy. Many of you know uh, Chaplain Thornton from his time here in teaching Sunday school class and being a part of this church. He and his wife Rhonda and their children have been members here for six years. He'll share uh, some of his ministry about what he's been doing these last several years. Brother Gary has been in the ministry for nearly 28 years, 15 of those in the United States Navy. He is currently the NORAD U.S. NORTHCOM Joint Plans and Operations Chaplain for Joint Force Headquarters, National Capital Region. Prior to that, Gary was the United States Marine Corps Wounded Warrior Regimental Chaplain. He's also served as chaplain for HMX-1, the Marine Helicopter Squadron 1, the Presidential Helicopter Squadron, the ship's chaplain aboard the USS Oak Hill, and Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, and with the run and ruse of the Atlantic Fleet, Seabees. Gary has been operationally deployed to, among other places, Fallujah, Iraq. Before entering military service, Gary pastored churches in California and Hawaii. He began his preaching and teaching ministry as an interim pastor in West Texas in 1990. And although he may sound somewhat Southern in his dialect, he is actually a native of Bangor, Maine, and a proud maniac. Gary and Rhonda have been blessed with five children, Matthew, age 27, Carly Renee, who passed away, uh, Laura, age 24, who is married to Andrew Horrell, the son Andrew, 21, Luke, 19. And they are also doting grandparents of gra granddaughter Avery, who is age four. Uh, would you join me in welcoming uh, Chaplain Commander Gary Thornton this morning to the pulpit? God bless you. It is good to be back with you here. Uh, this is a, a blessed place for us. We have been members here for six years. Uh, I had the good pleasure of uh, starting out here when I first moved here, my first tour when I was with HMX1, and uh, actually attended a Sunday school class at that time being taught by, uh, by Pastor Chuck. And so we were blessed when he uh, assumed leadership here for the music and the worship. Uh, I took that class and had the, the privilege and pleasure of, uh, of teaching a class here. How many of you here were part of that Sunday school class at one time or the other? All right, a goodly number of you. God bless you. I am surprised you are back today. Um, not really. No, just kidding. So, well, anyway, it's a joy to be with you again. I am, I am Rhonda's husband, uh, Luke's father. Luke, where is your father? <laughs> I'm here, my son. So, anyway, it is a blessing to be with you here today. If I don't know you, I'd love to, get a, get to, to have the opportunity to, to get to know you. So anyway, um, you know, if you were in my Sunday school class or if you've ever heard me preach before, you may know that I tend to break out in song either when I teach or when I preach, uh, which always gets a roll of the eyes from my wife and kids. I'm really not sure why. In fact, I looked at them, you know, I, I was talking to my wife the other day and she said, please, whatever you do, don't sing, don't sing. I said, baby, I promise I won't sing. You know what she said? She said, oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. Actually, she's more traditional. She said, praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> so, not really. So I've already broken my promise there. So uh, anyway, you'll probably hear me sing at some point or the other today. But again, it's a, a blessing to be here with you. I want to thank Pastor Scott for uh, allowing me to, to preach and to share today. And to all my fellow veterans, God bless you. Thank you for your service. And I know you, as, as well as I, consider it a privilege to have the opportunity to serve this great nation and our fellow war fighters in whatever uniform or service branch, they, whatever uniform they wear or service branch that they may be in. So again, thank you to our veterans. <clears throat> and so with that this morning, I'd ask if you have your Bibles handy, if you would turn over to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. If you are not a Bible scholar and do not know where Acts is in the Bible, it is tucked right in there between Genesis and Revelation. <laughs> that should help you. Acts chapter 3. We're going to look at a text in here today in Acts chapter 3, 
in Acts chapter 4. In fact, this morning what I'd like to share with you is what I like to call the five L's in ministry. How many of you knew that there are five L's in the word ministry? If you didn't know that, hopefully you will learn that by the end of my my time with you this morning. This sermon is also entitled, Five Keys to Effective Ministry and Evangelism. Many years ago now, in fact, 1986 to be exact, Robert Fulgham wrote a book entitled, All I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Now, I'm not really sure that that is true, but it is true that many of the most profound thoughts are simple. And we learn them when we're very, very young. In fact, Jesus himself said that unless we become like children, we will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus loved little children. And I think there were several reasons for that. He loved their innocence. He loved their humility. He loved their openness and their honesty. He just loved them because they were real. Little kids are are real. And sometimes I think that they have the capacity of faith that we as adults, we and all of our intelligence, somehow miss or lack. Jesus said, unless you become as a child, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He loved their ability to accept the profound truths of the faith, those simple truths that you and I hold near and dear. In fact, when I consider my own faith, I'm absolutely aware of that fact. I'm aware that I learned those foundational truths that really make me who I am today, those principles when I was a child. I'm sure many of you did too. Think about it for just a moment, if you will. You probably learned, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And how about this one? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. He's got the whole world in His hands. 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 And then Chuck reminded me this morning, deep and wide, deep and wide, right? Doing the wave out there, all right, so that's it. I won't even try to bust a move for you because it would be embarrassing, so that's okay. All of these things we learned when we were children. Heaven is a wonderful place. It's full of His glory and grace. Right? All these things we learned when we were very young. These simple truths. And they really are the most basic and foundational things that really make us who we are today. Well, in Acts chapter 3, we find the subject matter of another song. Now, we're not going to sing this children's song but here, Dr. Luke retells the incredible story of how Peter, how Peter and John were used of God to lead a lame man to salvation in Jesus Christ along with several thousand other peoples. Now, as is the habit here, I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. Again, turn over to Acts chapter 3, and we're going to read a rather lengthy passage that tells this whole story. In Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, we find these words. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. 
While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you, Barabbas. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We were witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Skipping down to chapter 4, verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Let us pray. Almighty, gracious, and loving God, we thank you so much for this incredible story. Father, we ask that you would just bless us with it today, free our minds from distractions and our hearts from anxieties, that we might give ourselves to you completely. Spirit, speak to us. Help us to understand the truths of this passage. Help us to understand it, to rightly interpret it, and then to apply it to our lives. Help us to be doers of your word and not just hearers only thus deceiving ourselves. This we ask in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In His name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as I said earlier, what I'd like to share with you this morning are the five L's found in ministry, found in this very passage. Many, if not most of the Bible commentaries I've read, sermons I've heard, have focused on Acts chapter 3 and 4 with regard to trying to determine and discern the exact condition of the lame man or trying to determine and discern the veracity of the miracle itself, specifically the miracle of hearing here, healing here. Now for sure, this is a miraculous story. For sure, a miracle of healing took place. But I would tell you that to focus on that alone is really to miss the point. There was a greater miracle here that took place. There was something greater that happened, and it was this. It was the saving of sin-sick souls. Not only this lame man, but several thousand others. That is the greatest part of this story that, unfortunately, all too often we overlook. And so this morning, I'm going to ask that we would step back just a little bit and focus not so much on the lame man's condition, Not so much on the miracle itself, but rather on Peter and John's interaction with this one who was lame from birth and who had been relegated to begging for a living. For as a result of their involvement, again, more than 5,000 men, who knows how many women and children came to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. As we here at Ramoth Baptist Church seek to be a Christ-centered community of refuge for families, as we reach out and seek to engage those who are lost, who are dying, who are bruised, who are broken, who are looking for hope, we need to be able to use these techniques, if you will, use these methods, if you will. We must do these five things, these five L's. The five L's are these. We must look. We must listen, we must learn, we must love, and then we must lead them to Jesus. They're seeking, will we share? Well, let's first look at the first L, and it's look. We must look in order to minister to people, in order to be used of God. We must look at them. Notice that in verse 3 we're told this, when he, the beggar, saw Peter and John, he asked them for money. Now we're not told that he looked at them, he simply asked. But we're told in verse 4 that Peter looked straight at him as did John. 
Now, I really prefer the New American Standard Version here because it gives added emphasis to this. It says that they, Peter and John, fixed their gaze upon the man. In other words, Peter and John looked intently at him. Let me ask you this morning, as you are traveling the highways and byways, as you are walking in your neighborhood, as you are shopping for groceries, do you really look at people? Do you see people and their plight? Do you take time to look into their eyes? Friends, it's been said, and I truly believe it, that the eyes are the windows to the soul. Amen. The window of the soul. It's amazing what insight you can gain by looking into someone's eyes. You can see pain, sorrow, loss, doubt. You can also see joy, success, admiration, and elation if you'll but look into someone's eyes. But you've got to look. Eye contact is an important form of nonverbal communication. It's a meaningful and a very important sign of confidence, respect, and social communication. It oftentimes, oftentimes communicates truthfulness and sincerity. However, it can be very awkward and uncomfortable. How many times have you been walking down the street and either looked into someone's eyes or maybe they looked into yours and both of you quickly averted each other and looked down at the ground? And it seems to be more and more so today. It can be very uncomfortable. And yet I would challenge you, we need to look into people's eyes so that we can see what is happening on the deepest levels of who they are. So that we can see that hurt and that pain. So that we can see that joy and that elation. So that we can see into their souls. Lack of eye contact may indicate fear, anxiety, nervousness, shyness, embarrassment, guilt, dissatisfaction, disinterest, or disbelief. It can communicate insincerity. According to a 2013 article in the Wall Street Journal, Austin, Texas communications analytic company, Quantified Impressions, analyzed the communication habits of 3,000 people. And what they determined in this study was that in these communications, in these conversations that they witnessed, people tended to make eye contact 30 to 60% of the time. However, what they suggest is very interesting. They suggest that actually, in order to make an emotional connection, you really need to be making eye contact 60 to 70% of the times at a minimum. Eye contact is tremendously important in order to feel connected. Now, the article also went on to suggest that the increase in technological gadgets and mobile handheld communication devices, as well as changing social norms, has resulted in reduced eye contact and thus a diminished sense of connectivity in our world today. And I would agree. I think it's true. How many times have you been at dinner with someone and they keep looking down at their phone? I am guilty of it too. It hinders the flow of communication in conversation. And unfortunately, I think that that bleeds over into our normal habits as we interact with people. Listen, we need to reverse that trend. We need to look. We need to see people. And the only way to do that is to establish eye contact. Peter said to the man, look at us. And this got his attention. And as a result, Peter and John were able to engage him in a Christ-centered conversation. Now, although the Scripture does not say this explicitly here, it is at least implied, if not absolutely apparent from the context, that the man made a plea of some sort, maybe even sharing his story once he had their attention. He probably shared his pain and his frustration he probably shared his disappointment at life and maybe even in God for his condition. He gave Peter and John his attention and they 
had already given him theirs. Verse 5 tells us, so the man gave them his attention, adding this interesting note. Now that they had his attention and he had theirs, he expected to get something from them. Friends, I would tell you this morning that if people approach you, especially if they know that you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if they know that you're a person of faith, they probably expect something of you. They expect some sort of response from you. So don't ignore them. Don't rebuff them or brush them aside. Ask them questions and then allow them to speak as you listen. This brings us to the second L, the second key to effective ministry. The second key that will help you to be used mightily of God is not only that you look, but that you listen. In order to be used by God to minister to people, <clears throat> you must listen to them. I'm always reminded of the fact that God gave us two ears and one mouth. That would tell me that we probably need to listen in a two-to-one ratio. Listen twice as much as you speak. If you do that, it's amazing how God will use you and what kind of insights you'll begin to gain into people. So let me ask you this morning, are you a good listener? Are you a good listener? And whom are you listening to? As a believer, you not only need to be listening to that person, but you need to be listening for God's still small voice and how it is that he is leading you in that situation. Let me ask you this morning, do you listen with your head or both with your head and your heart? It's so important to use both. Are you a good listener? You know, all too often I find that I like to talk about me. I like to talk about my life, my experiences, my hurts, my pains, my joys, my successes. And yet to do that is really to hinder my ability to get to know someone else better. And it really can hinder my ability to get to know what God is doing in their life. It is so important to listen. If you're going to be used by God in people's lives, you must listen. There's an interesting story about a zoologist. The zoologist was walking down the streets of a city with a friend, and all of a sudden he stopped and he said, did you hear that cricket? The young man walking with him looked and said, how in the world did you hear that cricket and all of this rush and hubbub? At which point the zoologist pulled a quarter out of his pocket, flicked it in the air. The minute it hit the ground, half a dozen people immediately looked at the coin. He said, you know, it's an amazing thing. He said, you always hear whatever it is that you're listening for. Think about that for just a moment. Are you a good listener and what are you listening for? What is it that you're trying to hear? What is it that you are tuned into? Hopefully, again, you're tuned into God's voice and what it is that he is saying and doing in the lives of other people. As believers living in a world of people that are lost and dying, bruised and broken, people that are going to hell in a handbasket, we need to be looking for, listening for opportunities to engage people in a salvific conversation. We need to look for opportunities to share the good news with people. We need to be looking for open doors to build re redemptive relationships with folk, with family members, friends, loved ones, neighbors, co-workers, and other people that we meet. Now you may be saying, well, that sounds great. I really want to be a better listener, but how can I do it? Well, here are some practical ways that you can become a better listener. Number one, resist the temptation to monopolize the conversation. Again, all too often I find that I'm guilty of that. Resist the temptation to monopolize the conversation. Number two, refuse to judge quickly or to be overly critical. People never like to talk to someone who thinks that they are holier than thou. And the fact of the matter is, is that ain't any of us super spiritual. Amen. We're just beggars showing other beggars to the bread. Amen? Right. Amen? Don't be critical or too quick to judge. Number three, pay attention. In other words, show genuine interest in whatever it is that people are saying to you. It is so important to do that. 
Number four, listen for their theology. Isn't it amazing if you'll just but listen to someone, what you'll learn about what they believe about God, about Jesus Christ, about church, about salvation, about their own human condition, about the resurrection, about heaven and hell? Listen with ears that are perked up to theology. Number five, be alert to nonverbal clues or body language. We've kind of already said that. Number six, ask questions strategically. You don't want to barrage someone, but you do want to ask strategic questions that can help you to learn about them. Number uh, seven, don't get sidetracked. How many times have maybe you found yourself in a conversation with someone and, and you start to share a little bit about your faith or to ask them questions and then they begin to try to avoid that question? They don't really want to talk about it. It makes them uncomfortable. That's okay. Try not to get sidetracked. Try to remember what it is that God may be asking you to do in that moment, in that conversation. And then eighth, try not to think ahead or rehearse what it is that you want to say in response. Again, you're supposed to be listening. So listen to what it is that the person may be saying to you. Remember, the goal is to listen so that you can be a better witness, so that you can share more effectively with this person that you're getting to know. So this brings us to the third L. The third key to effective ministry and evangelism is that we must learn. We must learn. Specifically, we must learn from people. Peter and John looked and they listened. The lame man gave him his attention. And I believe that he shared his need. He shared his frustration. He shared his life story with them. And they learned. Now, again, the Scripture doesn't say that. That is my interpretation. I'm reading between the lines there. But I believe that on some level there was something more exchanged there. And so they learned from him. And that helped them to minister to him, not only in his immediate need, but to his deeper need. It's amazing what you can learn about people if you'll simply look and listen. In fact, I would encourage you this morning, become an evangelistic eavesdropper. Become an evangelistic eavesdropper. Several weeks ago, my wife wanted to go hiking. Now, if any of you know me, I don't like hiking and I don't like exercising. So whenever she says she wants to go hiking, I know it's not for sightseeing, it's to exercise. Anyway, I relented and I went. We drove up to Great Falls. We got on the trail. Well, as we were almost finished, there were these people behind us and I could hear them speaking. I really couldn't avoid hearing it, but as it turned out, the young woman that was sharing with friends of hers that were new in the area that used to live out in San Francisco Bay Area, it turns out this woman is a reporter and she happens to report on the White House. I won't give away her uh, media outlet or, or, uh, or medium, but it was very interesting. And so I got home and as my wife usually says, I'm a Facebook stalker, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Google you know, investigator. So I investigated and tried to find out who she was, and I was able to find out who she was. I found her on Facebook. We're not buddies, I didn't bother her, but I know a little something about her. I have no idea how God may use that in the future. I hope that he does. I hope that it provides an opportunity or an open door somewhere. So I would encourage you. Be an evangelistic eavesdropper. You never know how God might use you. I'm not asking you to be inappropriate, but there are some situations you find yourselves in and you just can't help it. Don't be proud, don't be afraid, and don't resist the temptation. If God is urging, if he's providing the unction to say something or to introduce yourself or to make a comment, you never know how God may use you in that moment, Peter and John learned about the lame man sitting at the gate. They took note of him. He had been in that condition since birth. And of course, he was there every day, any time that they would have gone to the temple. And what was it that he wanted from them? Money. He wanted something to help him in his need, but oh, I have to believe that there was something more there. There was something greater, something deeper that he really desired deep within, something he probably dared not ask for. And I think they knew that. And they tapped into that. They understood, they discerned his greatest need. He needed healing for his sin-sick soul. 
Now with this in mind, Peter said to him, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I will give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then what are we told? They turned and walked on their way, right? They stood there and just looked at him, waiting for him to do something, right? No, they touched him. In fact, I really think that this fellow later in years when he told this story over said, he touched me, whoa, he touched me. Not really. They touched him. They touched him. Peter took him by the hand, the scripture says. He helped him up and, he, and then instantly, it says, the man's feet and ankles became strong. I like to think that they paired their faith with his faith, and the man was was healed. Imagine how their willingness to touch him must have moved him. I'm sure from sitting there all day long at this gate, he was dirty. He probably didn't smell very nice. But they touched him anyway. When you touch people, you communicate that you care about them. When you touch people, when you're willing to extend the hand, you do something that is powerful. And I believe that you do something that can be a great act of faith, whether it results in a miracle or not. In fact, I equate touching someone with love. Regardless of your theological opinion about Mother Teresa, she was not afraid to go to the unlovely. She was not afraid to touch someone that was dirty and diseased because she had that kind of love. I'll leave her eternal state between her and God. But my dear friends, I would tell you, we can learn something from her example. And I believe she learned it from Scripture. Peter and John could have as easily said, be healed, and then spun on their heels and turned and went on their way. Of course, they were going to do something that was very important. They were going to the temple to pray. But no, they stopped, they looked, they listened, they learned, and then they touched this beggar man. They lifted him to live on a higher level, literally and figuratively. What a wondrous demonstration of God's love they provided. And so love, that's our fourth L. The fourth key to effective evangelism, the fourth key if you really want to be used of God, is that you must love people. You've heard it said that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, it's true. The Apostle Paul said, without love, we're just clanging gongs and sounding cymbals. Without love, we gain nothing. We may speak in tongues. We don't do that in our Baptist churches. At least not publicly and openly. We may prophesy. We may have the gift of healing or God may give us the ability to encourage someone's faith so that they are healed, however you theologically interpret that. But if we have not love, it's worthless. It's worthless. It's empty. But love changes everything. Remember that old song, they will know we are Christians by our love. Our love for God, our love for one another, and our love, yes, for them. Love must permeate our being. And the truth of the matter is, is that if we don't love our fellow man, be they a person of faith or not, then the fact of the matter is, is that we probably don't love God quite as much as we might think that we do. Love is a demonstration of our relationship with God or lack thereof. Love is a must. 
In 1988, Christian recording artist Steve Camp cut a song on his 11th album titled, Don't Tell Them Jesus Loves Them. How many of you out there remember Steve Camp? Just a few, that, okay. That shows my, my, uh, my spiritual age. Uh, how many of you were Christians in 1988? Fair number of you, okay, maybe half. Steve Camp. Fire and ice. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. I used to rock out in my car to that tape. It was awesome. <clears throat> Saw Steve in concert, met him after the concert, invited him to dinner. Cool guy. Unfortunately, we didn't get to do dinner, but I wanted to pick his brain. You know, he had told about an encounter that he had with, of all people, Prince. That's it. And he stopped, and you know what he did? He looked at Prince. He listened to Prince in the elevator. He learned a little bit about Prince and the torment that he was going through. In fact, Prince asked him the question. He said, why do people hate me? Steve had the opportunity to witness and to share with Prince. I don't know if Prince ever made a decision to follow Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. But it wasn't as though no one had ever shared with him. Steve Camp did. But he had this incredible song. Don't tell them Jesus loves them unless you're ready to love them too. The chorus went something like this. Don't tell them Jesus loves them till you're ready to love them too. Till your heart breaks from the sorrow and the pain they're going through. With a life full of compassion, may we do what we must do. Don't tell them Jesus loves them till you're ready to love them too. Powerful powerful challenge and I'll be the first one to admit that there are people that are hard to love in fact some folk would tell you that I'm hard to love don't say amen please (laughs) my wife tells me I've gained a little bit too much weight I got up this morning she laughed at me I said baby when you do that you make me feel fat fat, dumb and ugly she said you're not dumb (laughs) so Don't tell them Jesus loves them unless you're ready to love them too. Because it's hollow. The fact of the matter is people that are lost and dying can't see God in the manner that we see God. They can see the evidences all around them, but they're blind to it. But my friends, we are His hands and we are His feet. If they see you, may they see Jesus. Don't tell them Jesus loves them unless you are ready to love them too. Imagine how powerful and meaningful it must have been for this poor lame beggar when Peter and John reached down and touched him, picked him up and lifted him to his feet. They inconvenienced themselves, they allowed the interruption from their spiritual activity, and they were even willing to get their hands dirty. They were willing to become uncomfortable for this poor beggar. And ironically, as a result of their involvement with him, they came to suffer persecution rather than to receive praise and thanksgiving. Love is a must, my friends, but love is costly. Love is costly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a wondrous love God demonstrated for us. But may we never think that it was cheap. It cost Jesus. He who was out without sin, it cost him his life. He suffered and bled and died for your sins and for mine. God led the way. In the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And this this brings us to to the fifth L and the final L. And that is this, that we must lead people. We must look at people. We must listen to people. We must learn from people. Absolutely, we must love people. But then finally, we must lead people. May I tell you today that you may love someone, but be totally ineffective? We have a nation of churches that by and large more and more are becoming less and less effective because they just want to love people but they don't want to present the hard message. I would tell you this morning that the pastor of our nation's largest church or one of our largest churches 
probably loves people. I don't know. I don't know him personally. I've never been in his church. I've seen it on television. I don't doubt that he may love Jesus. I don't doubt that he probably loves people. But I would tell you from what I've seen, he is sorely lacking in the manner and way in which he leads people to Jesus. It's not enough to just simply tell people that Jesus loves them. Because you see, we all have a problem. It's called sin. Someone that is lost has a sin problem. And we can't avoid dealing with that fact. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God, and that only the blood of Jesus Christ removes the consequences and the penalty, the condemnation of that sin. And there's none of us that are exempt. The Bible says we've all sinned. I would tell you I'm the chiefest of sinners. I'm just a rascal. I've got friends here that will attest to that fact. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. We have to lead people. We have to tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You may look, you may listen, you may learn, you may love, but if you fail to lead them in the truth, if you fail to tell men, women, and children the truth, that they need to acknowledge their sins, they need to confess their sins, they need to repent, that is, turn from their sins, that they need to believe in Jesus Christ as their only hope and receive Him as their Lord and Savior, then you will fall short, you will feel empty, and you will be frustrated in your endeavors as a believer. And my dear friends, they will be frustrated too. And I believe in eternity, if they were able to, I'm not sure they'll be able to, they would very well ask you, why did you never tell me? Why did you never share this truth that you had and that you knew? We must lead them in paths of righteousness. Now having said this, you must remember that you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him or her drink. Salvation is between that person and God. However, may we not be delinquent in sharing the truth. Whether or not they get saved is up to them and their God. We just have to do our part in sharing the truth. Sharing the gospel does not ensure that someone will receive it, believe it, and be saved. However, if you are willing to share, God very well may use you to help this person make a decision to come to salvation at some time or the other. Peter made a pretty simple and straightforward, albeit seemingly unreasonable, demand of this lame man. He challenged his faith. He issued an insensitive, inconsiderate, and some would have said impossible invitation. In Jesus' name, get up and walk. Can you imagine how that must have blown his mind? Wow, that's what I really needed someone to tell me today was to get up and walk. If he could have, he probably would have looked at him and said, Hey, look, Einstein, um, been this way since birth. Forget that fact. Imagine what the onlookers must have thought about what Peter did. That is until the lame man did the curly shuffle. He challenged him, and God blessed. What an incredible demonstration of the power of God in this situation. What an absolutely life-changing experience for this lame man. And what a humbling affirmation it must have been for the faith of Peter and John's faith for their trust in the Almighty's power. I mean, wouldn't it blow your mind if you could go out and just say to someone, hey, in Jesus' name, be healed. I would love to be able to do that. I would go to every hospital. I'd go to every injured person that I could find. God doesn't seem to operate in that way all the time. In this particular situation, He did. 
It blew the lame man's mind. It probably blew their mind. And think about those people again. They looked on in amazement and in awe at this spectacle that had taken place before them. What a powerful testimony. Now later, when Peter and John were questioned about this, actually interrogated about it, Peter summed it up succinctly by saying this. He, he provided the gospel in a nutshell. He said, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all plainly see. Again, imagine if Peter and John had just tossed some change, told him, we'll pray for you, brother, walked on their way. Imagine if they hadn't gone the extra mile, taken the time to look, to listen, to learn, to love this man, and then to lead him. We'd never sing the song. The song. We'd never read the story. And we'd never have this great and grand example. But they didn't. They took the time to look, listen, learn, love, and lead this lame man. And as a result, the lame man walked, he worshipped, the people wondered in amazement, the lame man Peter and John witnessed, and thousands believed and welcomed Jesus into their hearts. What an incredible story of salvation and of the power of God to change lives. I'll conclude today by asking this, who are you in this story. Are you the lame man that's lost or the lame woman that's lost? Are you the person that's heard of God but never entered into a real personal intimate love relationship with Him through Jesus Christ, His Son? My dear friend, if it's you this morning, I would beg you, I would plead with you I would implore you, I'd ask you with everything in me and all that I have, that you would receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That you'd understand that you are a sinner in need of God's grace. And that grace comes only by way of Jesus Christ. And if you'll enter into a faith relationship with Him, if you will turn from your sins and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you shall be saved. And you'll be healed. Who are you in this story? Or maybe you like Peter and John. You're the disciple that's going about your way, busy with all of the affairs of life, maybe even doing your spiritual duty, but maybe oblivious to the needs of those around you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and it's probably more likely that most of you here today are, I want to challenge you. God has given you a great commission. He not only wants you to share the good news with people, He expects that you share good news with people. It's not pastor's job to do it by himself. In fact, He is really here for teaching and equipping. God has appointed apostles, prophets, and evangelists, pastor teachers, for the equipping of the saints to do the work of ministry. You are the ministers of this congregation. You are the Christ-centered community of faith. You are the people that are going to provide the refuge for those who need to know Jesus, who need a place to call home. If I'm talking to you today, I want to ask you to really consider, are you willing to accept the challenge? So I'm going to ask right now that every head be bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to ask that the worship team would begin to make their way up front and we're going to move into a time of invitation. It won't be long, but we certainly want to give an opportunity for you to respond. You're not responding to me. I'm not important in this whole equation. But you are responding to God's word, to this story that he chose to include in his scripture. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to ask you this morning, are you like the lame man in need of healing and salvation. 
if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to invite you to do so. Again, there's a problem in all of our lives. It's called selfishness and sin. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of that sin is death, eternal separation from God. But there's good news, and that good news is that God loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, to die on a cross for our sins. I know it may not make any sense to you exactly, but in time and eternity, that was God's plan. And if you'll but do that, you can enter in and be called a child of God. If you're here today and you need that healing, that healing from your sin-sick soul, and maybe even a physical healing, I'd invite you right now to raise your hand and to indicate that to the Lord. Again, you're not responding to me. You're responding to God. God knows your need. He knows your heart condition. Would you do that right now? Would there be anyone here this morning? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? That's likely that you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But maybe you're struggling in your walk with Him. Maybe you need to recommit your life. Maybe you need to be refreshed and renewed. You've walked with God for many a year, but those flames that once raged inside of you have diminished to embers. If that's you this morning and you want to be used powerfully in the lives of other people, if you want to, to feel the excitement of your walk with the Lord once again, He knows that. But would you humble yourself and indicate that by the upraised hand? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? I see a hand right there. God bless you. God bless you. God knows your need, and I believe he's going to begin to do an incredible work in your life. Would there be someone else? Anyone else? I see a hand right there. God bless you. God bless you. Lord, do a work in that person's life. Anyone else? Friends, I would tell you that we all need refreshing each and every day. God's mercies are new every morning, and God knows I need his mercy every morning. Would there be anyone else? I see a hand right there. God bless you. God bless you, brother. Maybe you're here today and you're just bruised and broken. You're hurt and hopeless. Your life is falling apart. It may be your marriage. It may be relationships with other people. It may be your job. It may be your finances. You may be having mental and emotional problems. You may be having addiction problems. Friend, there's nothing that we cannot take to God. Amen. I'd encourage you this morning to cry out to Him. And if you want to do that here in a public way, if you want to make it concrete, would you raise your hand right now? Again, others' eyes are closed. I see a hand there and a hand there. Anybody else? I see a hand right there. God bless you. God, do a work in that person's life as they have humbled themselves before you. Would there be another hand anywhere else? Anyone else? God is waiting. He's looking at you. He's listening to your heart. The good news is He knows everything about you. He loves you. And He wants to lead you in what it is that He has for you in your life. If there's anyone else that wants that this morning, if you want to raise your hand, feel free. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the decisions that have been made here today. God, I thank you that we've had this opportunity to share in this glorious time together studying your word. Father, I just pray that you bless those hands that have been raised. Father, if there's someone in need of salvation, I pray that you move on their hearts, Lord God. Father, certainly for all of those in our community that don't know Jesus, that may even be objectionable to him, God, I pray that again you'd tenderize them, that you'd speak to them, that you'd draw them, and that you'd help them to see the truth of your word. Father, for those of us that need refreshing, refresh us now, we pray, for those hands that were raised, I pray a double blessing. And Lord, for all of us, we pray that you'd meet us in our moments of weakness. In the temptations, the trials, and the struggles, and yes, even those moments that we fall in sin each day. Lord, may your mercies be new every morning. 
And may we feel cleansed and renewed. This we ask today in Jesus' name. Amen.